Attention Duke Masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Chester Copycat, Kelly Colt, and the military media. Plus this day in history with the other London bombings and our song of the day by Lincoln Park on your morning monarchy for July 21st, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, giving you listener-supported, non-commercial alternative media every weekday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time, and we are streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Huge thanks to everybody that joins us here. It is morning in L.A. It is morning in Portland. We're streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. You can find links to the chat as well. A huge thanks to everybody who keeps us going and growing, and a huge thanks to our latest patron at patreon.com slash media monarchy, Siva Vinen. I love, actually, that just the names are getting more difficult for me to pronounce, which means that the show is getting bigger and more international, which really makes me feel good. Huge thanks, and sorry for the name mangling, Siva Vinen S., our latest patron. If you can give a little, I can give a lot. Also, a huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app and RadioConfluence.com. They spread the word about your media monarchy. It is Friday. That means the entertainment industrial complex. That's what we're talking about today and all the stories we're going to talk about you can find over in the tweets. Now, before we dive into our breaking lamestream news, quick word, sad word. Our good buddy Swagger Prince, she lost one of her kitties last night. Send her some love. That's rough. Super rough. But it is Friday, hopefully looking forward to a positive, safe weekend. So let's glance at the breaking lamestream news, my friends. Trump team seeks to control and block Mueller's investigation, so says the Bezos Post. Hawaii begins new prep for a North Korean missile attack. That coming from CNBC, three Palestinians dead in Jerusalem clashes. That says CNN, because we actually reported for you yesterday that's Stuff going down at the Temple Mount is generally always something worth keeping an eye on. The biblical implications are pretty large. Five teens who recorded and mocked a drowning man will not be charged in his death. And as we've done all this week, the very exciting look at the new feature brought to us by our lamestream news, and that is the fact check. Trump's misplaced Baltimore bias? from factcheck.org. Is this an actual supercell from Snopes? And Liam Hemsworth told Miley Cyrus he spotted a real-life mermaid? That's from the Gossip Cop. The other two are recycles from the previous days this week, showing that the old fact check is pretty much already outliving its usefulness. I also like to begin these episodes with a little bit of local news. In the local peak Portland news story this morning, longtime Portland comedy club Harvey's Shuts down. Big news this weekend for a downtown Portland institution and one of the longest running comedy clubs in the city. Harvey's has announced it's closing its doors for good. The news is a big hit for many comedy lovers. Christine Pitawanich is live there in the Old Town District tonight. And Christine, are they sneaking in any more shows? I know, that's what we all want to know, right? But no, Nina, unfortunately, their last show was just yesterday. You can see this place closed up, locked up, and that has a lot of people who love comedy in Portland torn up. So, yeah, I'm not... Uh I'm not a physically active person. It's I'm the so end of an era. The man who owns Harvey's Comedy Club in Portland is calling it after more than 37 years. For more than three decades, Barry Colin has helped run a number of businesses here at this location in Old Town, the most recent of which, Harvey's Comedy Club. He says he remembers lots of good times with talented comedians. So all of a sudden this young guy with red hair comes in and, and I said to him, well, you know, are you gonna, I, I want clean comedy. And he goes do you know who I am? And I said, no. He goes, I don't do clean comedy. That young guy who walked in was Louis C.K. Colin says he'll you? miss people celebrating birthdays or anniversaries or holding fundraisers, but he says a recent heart attack played a role in his decision to close Harvey's doors. They kept me alive and, and uh, put a couple stents in my heart, and, and my body's saying it's time to, to go do something else. Harvey's owner says he's hoping someone else will come along and reopen Harvey's and he wants to pass along the baton, he says, to someone else who will continue the comedic tradition and continue to entertain the folks here in Portland. Nina? Uh, my, my name's James. 
Now, here's the thing about Harvey's. They had been in Portland a long, long time. And even when I first got to the city, I was like, oh, we've got a comedy club. And I'd looked and I'd look and I'd look and I never, ever, ever heard of any of the single comedians that ever played there. You guys know me. I, I know a little bit about a little bit of stuff. Never heard of any of them. So, of course, that was hard to have the extra. Oh, I'm going to go out to the comedy club and see no one. Now, what happened a couple of years ago, and you've maybe heard me reference this as well, we got a little club that opened up here in Portland called Helium, and Helium was actually a chain. It started in Philly. You guys in Philly have the first Helium Club. Portland here, we have the second Helium Club, and I believe they've now opened a couple more. As soon as Helium opened, it pretty much obliterated Harvey's because immediately Helium was jacked into the new 21st century comedian setup and that was everybody on Twitter, Doug Benson, all the new comedians, all the hot new up and coming internet connected comedians were all instantly at Helium and they put on fantastic shows and I've seen Doug Benson there many times and I've met TV star and all kinds of people there. Harvey's was just not up to snuff so the minute a decent competitor came along they were pretty much toast. I also don't think I realized that they were clean comedy only, which is also probably not going to be a huge way to get a lot of butts in the seats. So that's the local way we begin this look at the entertainment industrial complex on your morning monarchy. Again, I'm James Evan Pilato, streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. A lot of days we do our morning show, and then two hours later we do our, our music show. We do our Pump Up the Volume daily DJ set at noon. Generally speaking, it seems like it's during Pump Up the Volume that all the news of the day starts to break and starts to bleed out, so to speak. That's, I suppose, a bad choice of words. But yesterday, as has been the case, we're doing the music show and then we start to see a bunch of bad news roll in. Chester Bennington, vocalist for rap rock mainstays Linkin Park, has died Calls was reportedly suicide at the age of 41. According to TMZ, law enforcement officers said the singer hanged himself at a private residence in Los Angeles County. Lincoln Park co-founder Mike Shinoda confirmed Bennington's death via, via Twitter, writing, Shocked and heartbroken, but it's true. An official statement will come as soon as we have one. Now, I actually do have the longer sort of report on this, but... the. A lot of interesting parts about this. And a lot of interesting parts, of course, will lead us, like so many things, over to our buddy Lauren Coleman. But first, let's get the report on suicide death of Chester Bennington. Rock fans all over are remembering the life and career of music icon Chester Bennington today. The 41-year-old Linkin Park singer was found dead in CBS 2's Jeff Nguyen is live. He's in Palos Verdes Estates where he was found, and it looks like suicide, Jeff. That is what the coroner's office is telling us, Sandra and Rick. And in fact, since this afternoon, we've been seeing family and friends show up at this property. A little while ago, bandmate Joe Hahn, who's the DJ of Lincoln Park, pulled into this driveway. Right now, you can see this property is completely fenced off during this time of morning. And as fans learn about what happened, many are, or at least a few are stopping by to pay their respects. Less than two months after Lincoln Park singer Chester Bennington performed Hallelujah at the funeral of his friend, musician Chris Cornell. Music fans are mourning the loss of Bennington's high-pitched screams that often showcase the anguish in his lyrics. Today, a fence was put up around this Palos Verdes estate's home, where the L.A. County Coroner's Office says it's investigating Bennington's death as a suicide. Dave Myers says Bennington and his family moved into the neighborhood about six weeks ago. Very good neighbors. Bandmate Mike Shinoda spoke on behalf of Lincoln Park with a tweet saying, shocked and heartbroken, but it's true. Why wasn't anybody there for him? <laughs> Today, at CBS radio station KROQ, Bennington was the subject of a tribute in which callers shared their sorrow with on-air personality Stryker, who says Bennington grew up in Arizona, but Lincoln Park formed in Southern California. They were our friends, our friends musically. We watched them grow in every single way. <clears throat> I'm just totally crushed. I heard the news and I couldn't move off my bed. Bennington had been open about drugs and alcohol addiction that had fueled many of his hits. And in May, he was one of many rock stars who paid tribute to Soundgarden singer Chris Cornell, who committed suicide. And I think he was beyond crushed by Chris Cornell. Today is Chris Cornell's birthday, but who knows how much that had to do with 
that's a terrible tragedy. Bennington helped Linkin Park to blend hip hop with rock and electronic music. The group gained praise for their collaboration with rapper Jay Z. At the home where Bennington is believed to have taken his own life, neighbors say they will remember a normal guy who was a family man. For being a rock star lead singer, he, he was very friendly and, and uh, conversational. And Bennington leaves behind six children from two marriages. For now, we'll send it back to you. July 20th was the birthday of Chris Cornell, who was born July 20th, 1964, in Seattle, Washington. Around 12.15 a.m. on May 18th, Cornell was found dead by hanging by his bodyguard in the bathroom of his room at the MGM Grand in Detroit after performing a show with Soundgarden at the Fox Theater on May 17th. Cornell was the founder and frontman for Temple of the Dog. Chris Cornell toured with Linkin Park in 2007 and 2008. Chester Charles Bennington, March 20th, 1976 to July 20th, 2017, was an American singer and songwriter best known as primarily the lead vocalist for the rock band Linkin Park. He was also the lead singer for Dead by Sunrise and fronted Stone Temple Pilots from 2013 to 2015. Scott Richard Wyland, if you don't recall, born October 27th, 1967, lead singer of the Stone Temple Pilots, died of an apparent cocaine overdose on December 3rd, 2015. Wyland was found dead on his tour bus in Bloomington, Minnesota, before he and his band The Wildabouts were scheduled to go on stage. He was 48. Chester Bennington first gained prominence as a vocalist following the release of Linkin Park's debut album Hybrid Theory in 2000, which became a massive commercial success. The album was certified Diamond by the RIAA in 2005, meaning it's one of the best-selling albums ever, and it is the best-selling debut album of the 2000s. Linkin Park's following studio albums, Meteora, Minutes to Midnight, Thousand Suns, Living Things, The Hunting Party continue the band's success, Bennington formed his own band, Dead by Sunrise, as a side project in 2005. That band's debut album, Out of Ashes, was released October 13, 2009. He worked on new material with Stone Temple Pilots in 2013 to release the EP High Rise on October 8, 2013 via their own record label, Playpen. Bennington has been ranked in the top 100 heavy metal vocalists by Hit Parader, number 46. Regarding the tragic news of Bennington's hanging suicide on Cornell's birthday. Our buddy Will Morgan writes, you totally called that, Lauren Coleman. Bennington also struck the Jesus Christ pose recently in his appearances, for example, after a decade's absence from Prague, where their Numb video was recorded. Linkin Park just played June 11th at the Prague Aerodome Festival, and you have photos of him striking the Jesus Christ pose. Fans who missed the Czech concert are noting on social media that they are numb because they'll never be able to catch Chester Bennington sing in Prague again. And then there's lots of other symbolism, pyramids, all-seeing eyes. The copycat carnage continues, my friends. So unfortunately, it's a rather holy hexes edition of your media mom's media monarchy morning show media memes. Ah. Let's keep doing this. Actor, songwriter, Red West, Gene Red West, longtime confidant of Elvis Presley, died in Memphis. Danita Allen of Memorial Park Funeral Home said West died Tuesday at the age of 81. His wife, Pat, told the commercial appeal he died at Baptist Hospital after suffering from a aortic aneurysm. Robert Jean Red West met Elvis in high school and worked with him for 20 years. He was a friend, driver, bodyguard. He also took small roles in some of Presley's films and co-wrote some of Presley's songs, including Separate Ways and If You Talk In Your Sleep. After Wes was fired by Elvis's dad in 1976, he went on to write a help book called Elvis, What Happened? The book, published shortly before Presley's death, included details about the singer's drug dependency and unhealthy lifestyle. West and his co-authors, Sonny West and David Hebler, said the book was an attempt to encourage Elvis to give up his dangerous ways. However, some fans said it was written out of spite because they were fired. Afterward, West became a full-time actor and appeared on TV shows and movies. His most famous role was in 1989's Roadhouse. Actor Red West, longtime Elvis confidant, passes away. And for our triple of obituaries on this episode, an up-and-coming French singer, Barbara Weldons, died on stage apparently by being elect electrocuted. Now, we reported this for you yesterday as breaking news when we were doing doing your pump up the volume yesterday. She had been performing at a church 
in the picturesque village of Gordon in the Lot region of the southwest when she collapsed. Storms were reported in the area at the time. Weldon's 35 suffered an apparent cardiac arrest and emergency services were unable to revive her. She had released her first album this year and had won several awards. She had become a singer after growing up in the circus, according to her website. Among her biggest influences was Jacques Brel. Last year, she won the Young Talent Award at the Jacques Brel Festival. She collapsed at about midnight on Wednesday while singing in a local festival. Investigators were looking at electrical equipment on the stage to find out what caused the apparent electrical fault. Weldon's regularly performed with a piano and acoustic guitar and was in the middle of a tour. She was due to give further concerts in France and Belgium in the coming months. Although little known, her February 2017 album, Le Grand de la Homme, Man with a capital M, had brought her national acclaim. A review on the Media Part website praised the softness of the melodies and the femininity and the masculinity of her work. She told the Midi Libre newspaper last year, I've always written poems, even when I was little. Then I took piano lessons as a teen. All I wanted to do was compose. Strange days indeed. It's almost as though we've kind of gone back to the 90s era of just rock star deaths. Now another one I've got for you is breaking news. Doctor Who companion Deborah Watling dies at the age of 69. The actress was best known for her role as Victoria Waterfield, the companion to the second Doctor Who, and she was diagnosed with lung cancer just six weeks ago. Now, of course, we noted for you last week, or rather yesterday, oh, time flies. Then, of course, George Romero died from lung cancer. Too much cigarette smoking. So now that we've moved into a little bit of Doctor Who and we're away from a little bit of the obituaries, Jodie Whittaker has been announced as the Doctor Who's 13th edition, the Time Lord, the first woman to be given the role. So lucky 13 Doctor Who's going to be a woman. The new Doctor's identity was revealed in a trailer broadcast at the end of Wimbledon's men's singles final. The Broadchurch star succeeds Peter Capaldi, who took over the role in 2013 and leaves in the forthcoming Christmas special. Whitaker, Jodie Whitaker, age 35, said it was overwhelming as a feminist to become the next Doctor Who. She will make her debut on the sci-fi show when the Doctor regenerates in the Christmas special. The Huddersfield-born star, who was a late favorite to become the Doctor, will find a familiar face on her set. Doctor Who's new showrunner is Broadchurch creator Chris Chibnall. Whitaker said, I'm beyond excited to begin this epic journey with Chris and every Whovian on this planet. It's more than an honor to play the Doctor. It means remembering everything I, everyone I used to be while stepping forward to embrace everything the Doctor stands for. Hope. I can't wait. The actress also stars another broad church link with Doctor Who, co-star David Tennant, who was the 10th Doctor. So Doctor Who's 13th Time Lord to be a woman, as was the style at the time. So interestingly enough, as long as we're talking about the UK, one of the other controversies raging in the UK. And what did I see? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys enjoyed the super deluxe jones iver song of the day yesterday that alex jones as if he were a folk singer song i've seen some other clips going around like, you'll never be as woke as this with jones basically <laughs> saying they've got their all seeing technological advancements where they're seeing the future and it's all mapped out but meanwhile they want you to argue about are you racist chris evans and gary lineker are the BBC's best paid stars, and Claudia Winkleman is the only woman in the top 10 highest earners, according to salary details published, which lay bare a blaring gender pay gap at the BBC. So, interestingly enough, let's go to The Telegraph to learn some more. I think we've made um, a lot of progress, but it's nowhere near where I wanted to be, because by 2020, I want to get to the point when it is equal between men and women uh, on our radio channels, on our uh, television uh, programs as well. I think we've made some progress um, and I think over the last three, four years, or the last three years anyway, 60% uh, of the new hires we've done for or promotions we've done have been women. That's good. You see that on the 10 o'clock news. You, you feel that on the Today programme, which now can be sometimes just presented by women. You see it on Strictly or indeed on the new uh, Doctor Who. Um, but I think we've got much more uh, to do there and I am determined to get it right. When I first came back to the BBC, um, I uh, wanted to get a, uh, another woman to present the Today programme. We did it. Uh, it took a couple of months. Um, I wanted to get our local radio stations 
who at that point, 14% of their breakfast shows were presented by women, the rest were done by men. I said, I want to get to half and half in two years, and we got there as well. I'm a great believer in action behind the principles you stand for. So that's the thing I really want to achieve in the next two, three years. But there are people who will look at this list and they'll say, actually, you might have made progress in your time as Director General, but the evidence is emphatically clear. Only a third of the people yeah. on the list are female. The top paid stars are dominated very much by men. And although individual circumstances vary and you have to look at rotary and all that sort of thing, there are several shows where men and women seem to do similar jobs and the men are paid much, much more. Isn't there actually quite a clear signal here, which is that for all the talk about gender equality, the BBC is way behind where it should be in yeah, 2017. We're, we're, we're making big uh, strides. Um, but I just want to stress, I'm not complacent. We have a lot to do. and. I want us to be an exemplar, not just to media companies, but to the whole of the UK about how to handle us. But if you look at the um, gender pay gap, which uh, the average for the whole of the UK is just over 18 percent, we're at 10 percent. So already we're in a better place than the average. But I'm not complacent about that. There's a lot to do. Um, and I'm determined that we're going to do that. Some call it the BBC pay non-scandal, but the BBC was forced to make public the names of 96 presenters and actors who earned over £150,000. More gender equity for our propaganda puppets. As is noted in the chat, as is also noted in the chat, seems that somehow we are all financing our own propaganda, mind control, and surveillance. And that's how it goes. And that's how it had been predicted. Particulation was an early blog I thought about running in the media monarchy kingdom. Particulation, where you participate in your own manipulation, and that's what's happening in the media sphere right now. And it is Marshall McLuhan's birthday. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, July 21st, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, giving you a fear-free look at what's going on in the entertainment industrial complex, as we do every Friday. A Manhattan federal judge on Tuesday said consumers accusing several big music companies of conspiring to inflate prices of music sold over the internet and on compact discs cannot pursue their claims in class actions. U.S. District Judge Loretta Preska's 89-page decision is a victory for Sony... Vivendi SA's Universal Music Group, Warner Music Group, and various affiliates in the 11-year-old lawsuit, which the judge said has been delayed by extensive disputes over evidence. Consumers accused the defendants of taking unfair advantage of their 80% share of the U.S. market for online music, and then by making music less attractive to buy, were able to drive up CD prices. But the judge said individual questions would quickly overwhelm issues common to potential millions of people who could be represented in a nationwide class action. She said this was particularly true given the likelihood that a significant percentage of potential class members might have unclean hands because they downloaded music illegally. As defendants have stated succinctly during this litigation, a plaintiff may not complain that one hand is being overcharged while the other hand is robbing the store. Lawyers for the plaintiffs did not immediately respond to requests for comments. Class actions let plaintiffs pursue claims in groups and potentially obtain larger recoveries than if they were forced to sue individually, which can prove too expensive. The judge also refused to certify nine separate damage cases, rather classes, for consumers from eight U.S. states and the District of Criminals, saying differences among states' laws would make class action litigation unmanageable. Preska also largely rejected an effort to exclude testimony from two antitrust experts retained by the plaintiffs and rejected an effort to exclude testimony from a computer forensics expert retained by the defendants. So every step of the way, the judge ruled with multinational media corporations. Judge rejects lawsuits over Internet music prices, even though it can be well documented. The super gouging of the compact discs. Again, we're paying for it. We're paying for our slavery. What, that's the, that's the joke at the end of Annie Hall. Yeah, the food at this restaurant's terrible. I know, and such small portions, too. Spotify hit with two lawsuits claiming staggering copyright infringement. This is a little bit of a follow-up of a story we brought you last week. The plaintiffs, including a founding member of the group Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons called the streaming giant's recent $43 million settlement with publishers and songwriters an empty gesture. Spotify may have hoped that a proposed $43 million settlement announced a couple of months ago would end a class action lawsuit and help to smooth over what had been developing as a trouble spot for the streaming giant, but a pair of lawsuits launched on Tuesday in Nashville indicate on that on the road to a widely expected IPO, Spotify still has a big copyright problem to solve. Of 
The lawsuits one is brought by Bob Gaudio, a songwriter and founding member of the group Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. His complaint alleges that famous hits including Can't Take My Eyes Off of You and Ragdoll are being distributed through Spotify without being fully licensed. The other lawsuit comes from Blue Water Music Services Corporation, an entity that administers the publishing rights of dozens of prominent country songwriters whose works include Players Baby Come Back, Miranda Lambert's White Liar, and Guns N' Roses' Yesterdays. You know, those great country songs. Together, the suits involve a few thousand song compositions, which in theory at least could add up to hefty damages bills in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The Blue Water complaint states that anything less than the maximum $150,000 statutory damage award for each of the infringed works involved herein would encourage infringement, amount to a slap on the wrist, and reward a multi-billion dollar company about to go public that rules the streaming market through a pattern of willful infringement on a staggering scale. More on that story from The Hollywood Reporter. And again, everything we say and play will always be included in the show notes. So even in just our sort of short hour long here, we can continue the research ourselves. So let's continue talking about what we brought up yesterday. R. Kelly is accused of keeping young women against their will in an abusive and controlling cult. Again, we hop to the NME. Another woman has spoken out against R. Kelly following allegations he is keeping several young women in an abusive and controlling cult. An extensive new investigation by BuzzFeed, which we went over a little bit for you yesterday, written by the interesting Jim DeRogotis, revealed several accounts from parents who claim their daughters are being kept against their will in several houses being rented by R. Kelly. This time, it's for allegedly running a sex cult of young women, mm. brain washing them as well. He makes them face the wall and not look at men when they come in. It's crazy. Wow, man. That is, when a woman's fed up, she would do just about anything. Okay. Can you stop with that? Hey, I'm a flirt. Now, R. Kelly apparently has six women in his Chicago and Atlanta homes, all between the ages of 18 to 26. I wonder if they trapped in the closet. Okay, dear. And the things that he makes these women do is, number one, he controls their phones, Mm. who they call, when they text, what they post on social media, if at all. And then on top of that, he makes them wear track suits not to show their figures. He also makes them face a wall when men are present so that they don't look at, I guess he doesn't want the men to look them in their face. But that's really weird because he per, he records their sex acts and then shows his boys. Yo, this is crazy. I bet they're thinking if they could just turn back the hands of time. Okay. All right. Just say another one of those. I apologize. Songs. I just was trying to get it going. You know, just put the key to ignition. This is so disgusting to me because he has a history of doing this. R. Kelly has been allegedly mentoring women, like, hey, I can help you sing, and mm. then forcing them or brainwashing them into some kind of sexual relationship. It just happened like, what, 25 years now? Man, it is ridiculous. Obviously, Age Ain't Nothing But A Number was a hit song written by R. Kelly, but performed by Aaliyah. And right. I mean, he got accusations going way back then. Right, because Aaliyah, he met her when she was like 12 years old, then he mm-hmm. ended up marrying her when she was 15. Which is crazy. Disgusting. How much of the same things they like, like Dear. fruit snacks, Transformers, naps, but it is completely unacceptable. And let's not forget that R. Kelly was accused of child pornography, 14 mm. counts, even though he got acquitted, because if you remember, he had that sex tape in the early 2000s with his 14-year-old goddaughter. He beat in her mouth. That The summer after her eighth grade year. Like, come on, bro. The craziest thing ever. The craziest wow. thing is that it was his goddaughter and she was 14 and he was completely fine with that. Right, like he has kids. What if somebody did that to your daughter? How could you do this to other people's daughter? It's just sickening to me. And the fact that people are still doing music with him. Lady Gaga a couple years ago, Mm. Ty Dolla Sign, Lil Wayne. Like, why are we still doing music with him? Why are people still buying his music? Jay-Z had the best of both worlds with him. It was crazy, man. Like, he was still throwing fiestas. It was just out of control, if you ask me. All right, so earlier this year, R. Kelly got sued for doing a little bump and grind with a cop's wife and then giving her chlamydia. <laughs> Yo, this dude is wildin'. Jeez. Somebody is going to do something harmful to him because you cannot keep sleeping with people's wives, mm. taking their daughters, performing sex acts on them, recording it, brainwashing it. Like, somebody, yo, bruh, some man is gonna put his hands on you. You know, this reminds me of the whole Bill Cosby situation. I don't know if I continue to support the artist and leave his personal life alone, or do I acknowledge the personal life and not support the artist anymore? Mm, maybe at some point our saying of art greater than artists doesn't really hold once the artist becomes more reprehensible. He gave a cop's wife chlamydia. Jesus Christ. RK Ultra, as has been noted in our very smart chat. 
They're busting R. Kelly, not the DC pedos. And that's how this rolls. Legendary rock groupie Pamela DeBar doesn't know any of the women in the alleged cult surrounding R&B singer R. Kelly, but she does have some insight into how women get swept under the control of star musicians. Though Kelly's campus denied the allegations, DeBar and a range of other experts on groupie psychology told Billboard that big name acts can seduce fans by doing everything from promising to boost their careers to providing financial support or escape from reality, and their power of persuasion is only increasing in this celebrity-obsessed age of social media. Pamela DeBar, you might know as being the author of I'm With The Band. She's one of the famous rock groupies. If you've ever watched any TV documentaries, documentaries about rock stars and groupies she's the first one they talk to imagine if the celebrity that you've always had a crush on shows you some attention in some way says john d moore phd author of confusing love with obsession when being in love means being in control now we can think about all of this with our powers you know the powers that shouldn't be and just like they asked the question in that clip why are people still buying this stuff because we love to finance our own slavery you're already coming into it infatuated and vulnerable and maybe even have imagined the relationship in your mind with him. The celeb asks, hey, you want to stay with me this weekend? And you do. And now you're there with him for the weekend and maybe you do things with him in and out of the bedroom. Then another request comes. And now the celebrity's letting you live there and taking care of your finances or food. It really doesn't take much to have that happen. He also notes that the power of celebrity and fame is deeply woven into the American psyche. We want to attach ourselves to something more than who we are to make us more than just the average. DeBar, who authored I'm With The Band after years of flying on rockers' private jets, standing on stage with bands and once hitting Vegas to see Elvis with Led Zeppelin, tells Billboard, it is a very addictive lifestyle, so I can see why someone wouldn't want to leave it. You can get more on that, not only from BuzzFeed, but also from Billboard as well. Why fans join cults of, mu of music stars. Now, the last couple of headlines here I want to get to so we can get to our last main story, and this will be the third week in a row that we've continued our investigation into military media. But Sherman Alexei, the author whose recent memoir, You Don't Have to Say You Love Me, chronicles his stormy relationship with his late mother, is canceling much of his book tour, citing a struggle with depression. Alexei will make appearances in L.A., San Francisco, and Menlo Park before heading home. Alexei revealed his difficulties on a Facebook post, saying, I've been sobbing many times a day during this book tour. I've sobbed in private and I've sobbed on stage. Alexei, whose other books include the short story collection The Lone Ranger and Tonto Fist Fight in Heaven and the young adult novel The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, said he had been seeing signs of his mother who died two years ago at several stops on his book tour. As I write in the memoir, I don't believe in ghosts, but I see them all the time. So Sherman Alexei cancels his book tour because his mother's ghost is haunting him. But meanwhile, Radiohead brought the house down in Israel. They played their vaunted show in Israel. And I fell for a little bit of fake news. I had to double check. I only put it in the chat. I didn't put it in the tweets yesterday. There was the fake news going around that Radiohead actually performed Pink Floyd's Money while they were playing in Tel Aviv, which would be an ultimate pro-level trolling of Roger Waters. Getting Radiohead to Israel was a major coup, not just because the band is beloved in the country, but because one of the independent promoters of the concert booked acts all through Tel Aviv all through the time. It felt like a cosmic night for us and the band. Now, here's the interesting part. It was Radiohead's longest concert in over a decade, clocking in at over two hours and 26 minutes. They pretty much played everything you would expect them to play. Absolutely Anything, the comedy that stars Simon Pegg and Robin Williams is the voice of his faithful dog, the last feature film that the Monty Python crew worked on together, has found some distribution. Atlas Distro will distribute the Terry Jones-directed film theatrically. The film also stars Monty Python pals John Cleese, Eric Idle, and Michael Palin. Outside of the documentaries, the Monty Python crew haven't worked on a feature film since 83's The Meaning of Life, and very sadly, it will be the last time as absolutely anything director Jones recently revealed to the British press that he has dementia, saying in a way only he could, my frontal lobe has absconded. Absolutely anything, the final film with Robin Williams and pretty much with the Monty Python crew. Now I've got an interesting Robin Williams sync coming up for you at the end of this episode, just like we have brand new music from Linkin Park coming up at the end of this episode. They had released a brand new video yesterday morning, the morning Chester Bennington hung himself. 
You are listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, July 21st, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com, streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. For the third week in a row, let's continue our investigation into the Hollywood military connections. Now, our friend Tom Secker has a new book. We've talked about that the last couple of weeks. But now, actually, Al Jazeera has a lengthy investigation asking the musical question that we all know is rhetorical. Is Hollywood too close to the military? From Iraq and Afghanistan to Yemen and Syria, the U.S. military has been keeping busy. But what role does Hollywood play in all of this? Is it a tool of Pentagon propaganda? And has the demonization of Muslims, and especially Arabs on the big screen and small, helped normalize, justify even, U.S. military intelligence? interventions in the Middle East. Joining me to discuss this today are Heba Amin, a visual artist and researcher based in Berlin who shot to fame in 2015 after drawing subversive graffiti on the set of the US TV series Homeland, and Dr. Roger Stahl, an associate professor at the University of Georgia whose book and documentary Militainment Inc. traced the relationship between Hollywood and the US military. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Uh, Roger, in your book Militainment Inc., um, you say that in order to understand U.S. militarism, especially in the Middle East, we should not just look to presidential speeches and public debates, um, but we have to understand the role played by Hollywood. Why and what role specifically are you referring to? Well, if we look at where our narratives come from in terms of U.S. foreign policy or European foreign policy, you know, the first draft of history is written by journalists like yourself, but as it settles in, you know, most people's experience of war and overseas military intervention really it comes from Hollywood and television uh, because most of this uh, experience is not of course firsthand it's mediated and I'm guessing you think those narratives are not accurate narratives historically accurate or, or politically neutral well like all narratives they're told by somebody and they represent certain institutional interests in order to understand how those narratives get to the screen we have to understand who's producing them and you know what the background uh, machinations and deals are that that eventually you know produce uh, what gets onto the screen uh, how about i mean you're nodding your head you of course uh, were involved in homeland the u.s tv series uh, about the cia very popular lots of fans but also lots of critics uh, who criticize its portrayal of uh, countries like Lebanon, Iran, Pakistan, and its portrayal of Muslims. You as a visual artist were commissioned by the show to draw graffiti on the set for a particular episode, um, and you used those scenes to write things like Homeland is racist and Homeland is a joke in Arabic on the background. Why did you do that? Well, I mean, we really wanted to critique Homeland's like conception of authenticity and how they um, as a, as a purely aesthetic vision of violence. And so, um, you know, it, it's known that Homeland collaborates with the CIA. Um, and, and in previous seasons, they had um, made many, many mistakes about um, the Middle Eastern narrative and the South Asian narrative. Um, a show like Homeland really approaches culture as um, set decoration. Um, and so Homeland, of course, um, who purports, whose show actually takes place in, in the Middle East, um, doesn't do the thorough research and doesn't have a deep understanding of what those narratives are in the Middle East and as, as a result has made many faux pas and, and many very kind of grievous mistakes about political narratives that in turn affect the people who live there. Um, Roger, in CIA related shows like Homeland, 24 and others, um, what's driving some of those simplistic, Heber talks about simplistic uh, narratives, sweeping narratives. Uh, we see it happen with Muslim communities when we're talking about the war on terror. We see it happen with uh, Latin Americans when you're watching shows or movies about the war on drugs. Is Hollywood producing content like this simply out of sheer ignorance? Or is this a deliberate decision by producers and studios to work with the US government, to collude maybe with the Pentagon or the State Department or various uh, security agencies? To the extent that the CIA uh, or other intelligence agencies have their fingers in the production of these shows, uh, they're looking to uh, legitimate their operations. Uh, they're trying to address controversial issues. Um, they're trying to secure congressional funding for the future. They're trying to send a message overseas about how powerful they are. 
um, and uh, whether their purpose uh, is noble. Roger, you're, you, you, you're almost suggesting that Hollywood movies, TV shows uh, are, end up being used as propaganda tools uh, by elements of the national security establishment. Is there any way of measuring the effect that they have on US public opinion about US foreign policy? Um, or are these just theories? Are you speculating when you say, you know, this influences this policy, this justifies that strike, this legitimizes that piece of torture? Well, there aren't complex and uh, uh, sensitive tools for le uh, measuring effects of that nature. What you can do is, is look at um, the institutions that are making these deals. You can look at script changes. You can look at public interviews that producers give uh, regarding their relationships. And you can look at how the uh, narrative of officially sponsored films and television shows changes over time. And it's fairly consistent. I mean, if you look at CIA-sponsored productions like 24, like Zero Dark Thirty, uh, uh, and Homeland, I mean, you just mentioned the subject of, of torture. And in, bo in all three of these shows, I mean, they basically treat the subject of torture in the same way, which is um, it ought to be used. We don't like to use it. We ought to, we ought to use it, though, because it extracts useful information and yeah, keeps us safe. I, I understand that point, but they would say, the producers of those shows, the writers would say, we're reflecting public debates. We're not causing the public to support torture or, or encouraging the military or the CIA to carry out torture. We're, sim we're artists. We're reflecting what's out there in the real world. That's our job. Well, to some degree they're doing that, but um, they would not be working with the CIA or with the Pentagon if uh, the Pentagon objected to the narrative that they were uh, portraying. So y you have to look at it as, um, you know, uh, they're trying to reach a number of audiences, and, and one of those audiences is the national security establishment with which okay. sometimes they have a very close relationship. Haber, what do you think actors and producers and directors and the studios, what, are they, what do you think they get out of these kind of relationships? Do you think it's one-way traffic? Well, I mean, I also just want to bring up the point, since we did talk about 24, um, and, and just to say that the same producers um, in, in, in 24, um, it was a show that did more than any other show to legitimize torture, and in fact was used in a very real life situation in, in the Supreme Court. So if we, if we start to pretend that artists are merely reflecting their surroundings, um, when in fact there is an interplay between the real world and the creative world, we really have to start to address the ways in which the entertainment industry is really complicit. And Heba, you're Egyptian, you currently live in Germany, you've traveled across the Middle East. Do you think Hollywood has the same effect on audiences outside the US as it does on audiences in the US? Surely uh, non-Americans don't buy into some of this quote-unquote propaganda uh, about U.S. foreign policy as easily as many Americans do? Or do they? Well, I mean, I, I can't purport to represent everyone in the Middle East, of course, but of course it has a various, a, a wide range of effects. And one of them is, is um, that I think many people feel very frustrated in the ways that not only how they're being depicted in Hollywood, which has very kind of wide reaching arms, but in fact, in turn, how that really affects real world politics. You can't convince an entire country to go into an illegal war in the Middle East without having previously convinced them of a certain kind of image of a bad guy. And Hollywood plays a very big role in perpetuating that image. So someone like myself, if I'm a fan of Homeland and 24, is that bad? Is that wrong? Because people would say, you know what, I leave my politics at the door when I go into a cinema. I can be very anti-war in real life, but watch lots of war movies for fun. Well, I mean, entertainment is not apolitical, and in this kind of globalized world that we live in, and, and given the current crises that we're, we're experiencing, I think we can't um, extract ourselves from these situations. Ultimately, we're all complicit in these narratives. So as a viewer, I think you have to be conscious of, of what it is that you're, you're supporting and whether those are in line with your ethical and, and moral beliefs. Roger, uh, given you've got Hollywood studios making a lot of money from some of these big budget films, winning Oscars for films like Zero Dark Thirty about the CIA and torture, and on the one hand you've got them making money, on the other hand, as you say, the US government, the Pentagon CIA, gets obvious benefits from working with actors and studios. Do you see any chance of any kind of change or reform to these relationships? It, it requires a, a certain kind of critical awakening. I mean, in an ideal world, I suppose I would, I would like a law that would require the CIA to stamp its logo on the front side of every movie as you walk into the theater. 
Um, but uh, <laughs> short of that, we have to do a lot of critical work in order, in order to understand that these relationships exist. Roger Stahl, how about, I mean, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining me for this fascinating, very important conversation. Maybe the smartest move to make is to not walk into that theater in the first place. Now, if the CIA and the military are involved in seemingly mundane shows like Cake Wars or The Biggest Loser, like we talked about last week, heavy military involvement in The Biggest Loser, don't you think they're probably heavily involved in all the other TV shows and movies? As is noted in the smart chat, the American Psychology Association was involved in directing most of the Guantanamo interrogation. And every action movie, all the big movies now, it's all just filled with torture. We've talked about this a lot in our work, and you can find my interview with Tom Secker and Pierce Redman where we talk about The Race to Witch Mountain, the Disney rock movie that had heavy CIA involvement involving the alien question. But also some of my work with Corbett Report. That's pretty much going to do the fairly dark Friday edition of your Morning Monarchy. We always like to glance at some of the albums coming out as well. I feel like I probably had a little bit more to say about the uh, CIA media there. But let's continue the conversation. You can always reach out to me, james at mediamonarchy.com. Love to hear from you. New records coming out today from Foster the People and Childhood and Chris Robinson and long-running punk, pop-punk, ska band Goldfinger have a new one where pretty much it's just the lead guy, John Feldman, but he's recruited Mike Herrera from MXPX and Travis Barker from Blink-182, so it's probably pretty power-packed. Holy Fuck has a new record coming out. Um, and that Ramones, Leave Home, 40th Anniversary comes out today. There's a few other records, you know, Billy Ocean, Sarah Evans... And yes, that new Lana Del Rey album comes out today, but as I discovered through a little bit of clicking around yesterday, it gets released digitally today, and I think maybe compact discs, but because we are in peak vinyl, the record's not going to be out actually for months. It won't be out on vinyl until September. So, meh. We'll deal with more of it then. I've pretty much played most of the songs I like off of that. We mentioned yesterday on Pump Up the Volume when the suicide of Chester Bennington was breaking that their recent record had just come out in May. It's called One More Light, and it was not being very well received. People were looking at it as saying, oh, Linkin Park has gone pop. So we'll hear that final song with the video that came out the morning Chester Bennington hung himself as our song of the day today. But first, let's look at this day in history, my friends. July 21st, 1865, in the Market Square of Springfield, Missouri, Wild Bill Hickok shoots and kills Davis Tutt in what is regarded as the first Western showdown. 1873, at Adair, Iowa, Jesse James and the James Younger Gang pull off the first successful train robbery in the American Old West. July 21st, 1877, after rioting by Baltimore and Ohio railroad workers and the deaths of nine rail workers at the hands of the Maryland militia, workers in Pittsburgh stage a sympathy strike that is also met with an assault by their state militia. July 21st, 1925, in Dayton, Tennessee, high school bio teacher John T. Scopes found guilty of teaching evolution in the class, and he is fined $100. July 21st, 1944... It's the not surprising conclusion of one of the stories we told you yesterday. Klaus von Stauffenberg and fellow conspirators are tortured and executed in Berlin, Germany for their plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler the day before. That's swift justice. July 21st, 1959, the NS Savannah, the first nuclear-powered cargo passenger ship, is launched as a showcase for Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace initiative. There's another Radiohead sink. They're just weaseling their way into our shows every day now. July 21st, 1969, Duke Ellington and a portion of his band perform a 10-minute composition on ABC titled Moon Maiden. The event took place one day after Neil Armstrong became the first man to set foot on the moon. I don't know if I've ever listened to that. I have to punch that up. July 21st, 1972, with more on the troubles. They call it Bloody Friday. The provisional IRA detonate 22 bombs in central Belfast, Northern Ireland, United Kingdom in the space of 80 minutes, killing nine and injuring 130. July 21st, 1973, in Lillehammer, Norway, Mossad agents kill a waiter who they mistakenly thought was involved in the 1972 Munich Olympics massacre. 
July 21st, 1976, Christopher Ewart Biggs, the British ambassador to the Republic of Ireland, is assassinated by the IRA. And as we were noting the other day, in a lot of ways, when you hear IRA, you should sort of think MI5. July 21st, 1983, the world's lowest temperature in an inhabited location is recorded at the Vostok Station in Antarctica. That is negative 89 Celsius and negative 128 Fahrenheit. Now we get to some of the better stuff. Friday, July 21st, 1987. Guns N' Roses released their debut album, Appetite for Destruction. I guess it was probably a Tuesday, but it's Friday right now. And it was probably a Friday, though, in 1989, July 21st, when Weird Al's movie UHF opened. Did you guys never see UHF? Fantastic, hilarious satire featuring a young Michael Richards pretty much doing Kramer before he would actually be Kramer. I saw UHF in the theater. July 21st, 1996, Soundgarden's Kim Thale was arrested for allegedly hitting a fan that was trying to take his picture in a hotel in North Carolina. July 21st, 1997, C. Dolores Tucker, I hadn't heard that name in a long time, filed suit against the estate of the late Tupac Shakur. The suit alleged intentional infliction of emotional distress, slander, and invasion of privacy due to derogatory lyrics about Tucker. The lyrics about C. Dolores Tucker, a lobbyist against gangsta rap, we're on Shakur's last album, All Eyes on Me. July 21st, 1998, the Beastie Boys begin touring for their fifth album, Hello Nasty. I got to see them on that tour with Mixed Master Mike finally as their DJ. And July 21st, 2005, terrorists attempt to attack the London transit system by planting bombs on three subways and on one bus. None of the bombs detonate completely. The attempted attack came exactly two weeks after terrorists killed 56, including themselves, and wounded 700 in the largest attack on Great Britain since World War II. The previous attack also targeted three subways and one bus. July 21st, 2005, London bombings occur. It was just before half past 12, July the 21st, 2005. The rush hour was over. It was a beautiful day. The tube was half empty. Then the CCTV camera catches a man with a rucksack. It's Ramzi Mohammed, his left hand in his pocket where the prosecution says he had a battery to detonate a bomb. And suddenly he looks behind him. Everyone else on the carriage jumps at the explosion and starts to panic, leaving the carriage by the end door. On a camera at the other end, a man in a white t-shirt is seen assisting a mother with her nine-month-old baby and pushchair, who told the court today she thought they were going to die. Her helper then turns on the man with the rucksack. They shout at each other across the carriage, the situation clearly tense, until the train pulls into Oval Station. There, all the passengers pile out onto the platform. Ramzi Mohammed in his New York hooded sweatshirt cuts through the crowd, one witness said he was running like Linford Christie. As he heads towards the exit at speed, some passengers are in hot pursuit. The man in the white t-shirt inside the carriage was revealed today as Angus Campbell, an off-duty fireman who came to court to give evidence. He gave the jury his version of the confrontation on the train. He said, I was shouting, what have you done? What have you done? He said, this is wrong, this is wrong. Angus Campbell asked about a pile of smoking, sponge-like material on the floor. I said, what's that? He said, it's bread. It made no sense to me. I was shouting at him. I was probably being quite vociferous. I wanted him to lie down. He became agitated. I would say aggressive. The jury also heard from Arthur Burton Garbett, a 72-year-old former soldier. He was one of the men who gave chase. He can be seen here in the pink shirt running down the platform but he eventually ran out of steam. He said he would have been fitter if it hadn't been for a recent gallbladder operation. The next moment, Ramzi Mohammed was seen running out of Oval Station, still wearing the distinctive New York top. He crosses this road at speed and then disappears off over there towards Brixton. <coughs> Within minutes, the emergency services were on the scene. It was just two weeks after the carnage of the 7th of July. London's police were already stretched to the limit, but they began the process of gathering evidence again. The result, the graphic eyewitness testimony at Woolwich Crown Court today. The failed copycat London bombings two weeks to the day from the 7-7 bombings. 
Now, I guess on a little bit of a brighter note, y'all in the chat are still talking about concerts when the Beastie Boys head off on their Hello Nasty tour. Somebody in the chat said they saw them when they opened for Madonna on her Like a Virgin tour, which is pretty awesome. Somebody else also said their first concert was Queen. So you have to be better than everybody else. <laughs> I'm kidding. Published to Media Monarchy. Oh, wait, no, one more. July 21st, 2011, NASA Space Shuttle program ends with the landing of Space Shuttle Atlantis on mission STS-135 at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. They are endeavoring for a new Atlantis, and all challengers will be destroyed. Oh, wait, it's a Colombian endeavor to reach a new Atlantis, and all challengers will be destroyed. Published to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, brutal U.S. and Sunni alliance is ugly but effective. And there was a massive, massive Ron Paul article in the New York Times Magazine. I probably saved the actual issue. The anti-war, anti-abortion, anti-DEA, anti-Medicare candidacy of Dr. Ron Paul. Those two articles as well as an episode of Media Monarchy, published to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today. Interesting, sexy run of birthdays today. The aforementioned Marshall McLuhan. It's also K-Star's birthday and West Virginian Don Knotts. That's right. He was born in Martinsburg. Janet Reno's birthday, Kim Fowley's birthday, John Negroponte, Paul Wellstone, Ken Starr. Those are all pretty much the gross ones. Then it gets a little bit better. It's Cat Stevens' birthday, Gary Trudeau's birthday, the late great Robin Williams, born on this day, 1951. It's also Taco's birthday, John Lovett's birthday, my buddy, Jim Martin, ex of Faith No More, Charlotte Gainsbourg, Josh Hartnett, Damian Marley, all celebrating birthdays today. And coming up a little bit later in the afternoon, we will have your daily DJ set at noon. It will be a new Music Friday. And as we'll wrap up this episode... We'll listen to what is essentially now the posthumous song from Linkin Park, Talking to Myself. This new video and song was released yesterday morning, the morning Chester Bennington of Linkin Park hung himself. It is from their now final album, One More Light, which was not being well received. It's a different sound for them a bit. Other bit of breaking news I'm just seeing, Sean Spicer has apparently quit the swamp, my friends. News won't stop, but we'll keep looking at it in a fear-free fashion. That is... The Friday Media Memes edition of Your Morning Monarchy for July 21st, 2017. And I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com again. Thanking you so very much for listening and taking part all this week in the Media Monarchy Kingdom and for your support. And reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult all remixed with music and media that matters go to mediamonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent non-commercial alternative media going and growing thanks